Dear friends and colleagues, welcome to the third model of the WEMS Hippocrates webinar. The topic of uh, this year is neonatal uh, neurology, brain is its title. And please to remember that in previous models, we had over 20,000 participants uh, with over 100 connected countries. Also this year, the model will certainly be a success because uh, we have two great experts in this sector as chairman. And uh, now I give the floor to Professor Joy Noy, uh, chairman of Hippocrates, and I leave him the honor of introducing Professor Linda De Vries and uh, Professor Luca Ramenghi, whom I thank for their collaboration. Please, Joseph. Thank you. Thank you, Corrado. It's uh, wonderful to be here again. And uh, I want to welcome everybody to this uh, outstanding session that has been largely organized by uh, Professor uh, Luca Romenghi and uh, uh, Linda De Vries. Uh, Linda is going to be the, uh, <clears throat> the main moderator for today. And uh, I just want to give a little introduction. I know, I know that she probably does not need an introduction for most of you, but uh, uh, she is uh, um, from uh, Utrecht, Netherlands, and she's one of the foremost experts in the field of neonatal neurology and predictor of uh, neurodevelopmental outcomes in high-risk and full-term neonates. Uh, and she uses neurophysiology and imaging techniques to make these predictions. She has assembled, she and uh, Professor Rumanji have uh, assembled an outstanding team of experts for our sessions on the brain. And uh, these uh, sessions will span from some of the basic science aspects of uh, intraventricular hemorrhage, for example, to some of the uh, 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 areas where we can actually uh, use day-to-day -day in the treatment of these uh, 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 very sick preterm babies. So I'd like to give the floor to, uh, to Linda. Uh, welcome, everybody. <clears throat> well, thank you so much. First of all, I really would like to thank Professor Corrado and Professor Noy for giving us the opportunity, Luca Ramengi and myself, to have organized these five mo modules on neonatal neurology, which is really, really wonderful. And I'm sure that the modules are going to be as exciting as the music we just listened to as the introduction of this uh, first session. Um, unfortunately, due to kind of unforeseen circumstances, Professor Balim Pravin Balab is not with us today and we will find him and he will probably speak to us either tomorrow or during one of the other modules. And we are very, very fortunate that uh, Professor Ramengi was willing to step in at the last uh, moment and he will give a first part of his lecture that was meant for tomorrow today and we will discuss what we will do tomorrow. Either Pavin Balap will be there tomorrow or Luca will be continue with his talk that he has prepared for uh, a longer. But it's a really great honor and privilege to um, introduce Luca Mingi, my co-moderator. <clears throat> and um, we already know each other for almost 30 years. And we first met in the beautiful city of Assisi for the earthquake in 1993. And at that time, he was just traveling to Leeds where he spent six years together with Professor Malcolm Levine who was also doing groundbreaking work in neonatal neurology and had been working with Lily and Victor Duhuich before at the Hammersmith Hospital in London where I spent four years myself. So since that time we have been in touch and he then moved after Leeds to Milan where he was working as a neonatologist with a specific interest in MRI that he kind of learned with Professor Levine and then in 2011, he moved to Genova, where he is now the head of the neonatal um, uh, neonatology department and still has got a very keen interest in neonatal neurology, as you will hear from his talk today. So he has been publishing a lot. He is part of the European Ultrasound Consortium and uh, he is very active in the field. So Luca, we are very, very lucky to have you with us here today. And please go ahead and give your talk about IVH uh, through different gestational ages. Thank you, Linda. Thank you so much. I'm trying to <clears throat> share the screen now. And uh, um, here we are. Thank you for mentioning uh, as well uh, 
uh, Malcolm Levine, uh, and we started uh, <clears throat> very early in our life, uh, also thanks to his support in this field, a very generous introduction. Uh, I, I hope you will forgive maybe some sort of not total precision of the, of the slides, but uh, the, 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 the scope was to speak about how high VH may be different according uh, with premature babies, but also term babies. And so I will focus mainly on the first part now uh, in order to uh, give a story that is my story about IVH and uh, my point of view, what is interesting in my opinion in this uh, kind of webinars is also to, of course, medicine is one, but the, to see uh, how different kind of colleagues may face the same kind of uh, problem. So where to start speaking about IVH? So I just uh, add a few slides now. And I, I always like to start from the, the real life uh, and the story. And uh, about the story uh, on this subject, uh, very often it is started with uh, pathology. Very, very unusual nowadays, but uh, you can see here uh, that uh, it was clear already, I mean, we're speaking about 1978, so I have to say, Linda, before we met uh, and uh, in Assisi, and uh, you, can, uh, you can observe uh, on, the, on that line that uh, majority of these uh, uh, hemorrhage in, with the blood in, inside the ventricles is coming from the germinal matrix. Uh, uh, lower is the gestational age, higher is the risk. And there is already something that is not so uh, very clear, how to diagnose when it is not coming from the germinal matrix. And we're facing the same problem that pathologists did face ages ago. So I can say, uh, the blood is coming from the general matrix or subependymally, such as we were speaking a, a few years ago, uh, when you see the hemorrhage originating there. But otherwise you say, well, it's not coming from there and very likely it's coming for choroid plexus. So the general matrix hemorrhage can be um, isolated inside the general matrix area around 23, 24 weeks the death of the germinal matrix, it is around uh, three, even four millimeters. A lot seems, seems very tiny, but it, it is very important and a lot. And now when we speak about hemorrhage to introduce MRI, we should uh, introduce something uh, that is very popular nowadays, uh, Linda already, uh, published uh, data on, I guess, 2011 on this uh, uh, kind of MRI that is called susceptibility weighted imaging, in which we, de we do see that uh, very early you can have the hemorrhage, even not at the most common uh, uh, site, that is the caudothalamic notch. You see a 25 week uh, baby and a 32 week baby started at term corrected age and you do see the hemorrhage in a different area. This technique is very uh, useful and is superior to gradient echo standard we were using up to a few years ago to identify blood and amosiderine. You can easily see the vein in the brain. And why you get this uh, hemorrhage? You get for a number of reasons, it's a multifactorial disease. This, this is just to mention the speaker that unfortunately can't join us today, uh, Parvin, that has done a lot of uh, extremely nice work on the very microscopical uh, justification of. And sometimes it, uh, we do have observed in pathology studies the beginning of the problem with uh, some sort of uh, uh, thrombosis inside these tiny vessels. So it's, very, it's a very nice review paper 
uh, I'm still thinking is one of the best uh, uh, from Gazibiri uh, explaining how the hemorrhage does originate. And uh, we do know today that he is uh, an hemorrhage mainly from uh, uh, the venous side. And we uh, observed that uh, being thrombophilic, uh, it's an adding risk for that. So it's a multifactorial disease, but for uh, uh, a number of reasons, there is still room to study why. And of course, the instability of these babies is very important because the babies in the first three, four days of life, they do have uh, the hemorrhage uh, closer to the birth, worse is the, the, the outcome as well. And the first idea that was uh, based also on anatomy, because if it is coming from Venus side, was from uh, Claudine Laroche, a pathologist that is very famous because together with uh, Banker in 1962, she named uh, and she created the definition of periventricular leukomalacia. And we do uh, see her first observation of 1964, in which she claimed that uh, a very narrow anatomy may increase the risk of uh, hemorrhage in that area. And we tried to duplicate his, her idea uh, our first uh, um, um, hypothesis uh, with MRI, and then again, thanks to this uh, technique called uh, SWI, susceptibility weighted imaging, and seeing how, how narrowing uh, uh, the anatomy may favor, such as we have observed the two different kinds of anatomical variants in the subependymal veins, suggesting that having one of these may uh, increase the risk uh, of uh, having uh, the hemorrhage together with the other potential risk factors that are coming from the prenatal life. So we also quoted uh, the HOTS ratio of this anatomical pattern compared to the most known like pneumothorax. And uh, as you can see, it's not so far having this anatomy in terms of uh, increasing the risk. Just going to very simple um, steps, uh, how to diagnose the disease. Well, uh, ultrasound now is uh, doing an extremely nice job and uh, we can observe uh, the hemorrhage when it's uh, isolated at the level of a caudotamalamic notch, but we can observe also the intraventricular phase uh, on the left sides of the of the screen, you can see a normal ultrasound on the right side, um, oh, um, the hemorrhage with the clot inside the ventricles. And so to say that there is an interventricular hemorrhage, we all know, especially for very low degree, is not so easy. And in some way, we can say that the intraventricular hemorrhage is a complication of the general matrix hemorrhage. And very easily with MRI, even without the susceptibility weighted imaging, you can understand how the intraventricular phase is probably following uh, the rupture of a subependymal area. Uh, again, uh, speaking about the problem of having uh, difficulties in diagnosis lower degrees, we showed that uh, very, very uh, small hemorrhage can be missed by ultrasound and diagnosed even weeks later because we're speaking about MRI of very premature babies at term corrected age. And uh, this increased sensitivity of MRI is pretty obvious, but uh, the problem is further compounded by uh, when we diagnose maybe an hemorrhagic pattern of the caudotalamic notch, maybe later after one or two weeks say, well, it may be grade one hemorrhage, while uh, like in this uh, example, you don't see any blood confirmed as well by susceptibility weighted imaging. And therefore we, we understand better thanks to MRI that that kind of appearance is mainly 
an anatomical involution of the germinal matrix area of these premature babies. No doubt that the, the incidence of intraventricular hemorrhage, and thanks to uh, the support of Andrea Rossi, our neuroradiologist, we, we can easily see these are unpublished data or our um, uh, data set uh, about the babies we, the first 500 uh, very low birth weight babies we uh, scanned with the MRI, and you see an increased frequency also of the minor forms of a hemorrhage. But what about uh, the meaning of having an hemorrhage such as uh, in babies very early in gestation at risk of life with the viability uh, not so improved? Uh, I'm speaking about 23, 22 either uh, babies. This is a 23 weeker on the image. And these are um, otherwise uh, uh, ultrasound scans of the baby who developed a very severe IVH with a venous infarction. We will see later what is it, but even a very rare um, bilateral venous infarction. The bilateral venous infarction should uh, tell us something different, but in some cases, very early in gestation, it can be a devastating event, uh, complicating uh, the IVH and uh, of course, associated with the death of babies. And in fact, there are still data that the, at that gestational age between 22 and 25 weeks, and as you can see on this paper, we can observe uh, that uh, IVH can be also the reason of the death uh, uh, of the baby, uh, very close to the respiratory problems too. But uh, if we go back to some sort of a clear pathology image, we can observe in this image that we have any kind of complication. We, we discussed a bit uh, earlier that uh, potentially IVH is a complication of a subependymal hemorrhage that is germinal matrix. We were calling the subependymal because it was not clear which part of the brain was at that time. Uh, and you see also the infarction that is, as I told you, unilateral and the dilatation of the ventricles, so the post-hemorrhagic ventricular dilatation. So what's about venous infarction? Of course, we all know that uh, uh, most severe is the hemorrhage, uh, higher is the risk to develop uh, the venous infarct, uh, and the medullary veins are the area of the brain and the vessels that are involved by this kind of uh, increased venous pressure that is causing a damage into, into, the, into the parenchyma. And uh, you can observe here very severe uh, hemorrhage, uh, also with not such a big intraventricular hemorrhage. This is an important issue too. And sometimes you, luckily you have a very tiny, like in this baby, um, uh, outcome of the venous infarct sufferance in one part of, of the brain uh, uh, of this very tiny baby uh, later on. The site of the venous infarct uh, is very important for the outcome, of course, but uh, we have to remember that uh, for sure later on is much rarer compared to very preterm babies, but it's still possible to observe that that, kinds of, uh, uh, that kind of hemorrhage and of complication of the hemorrhage has this MRI coronal scan and axial scan can show easily the involvement of the parenchymal area. And, uh, here we're facing again the problem of uh, thrombosis, of a venous thrombosis in which thrombophilia uh, is likely to play a role. Uh, and again, we like to say that uh, any kind of germinal matrix hemorrhage, even though uh, the most severe ones are more likely to cause uh, venous infarction, 
but it's still possible to have minor forms with uh, not so severe, but minor or medium or me, well, I would say moderate uh, involvement of the, of the brain parenchyma. And this is again was highlighted by this very nice paper more than 10 years ago in which it was clear that these babies, we were not expecting in these babies uh, the occurrence of intraventricular hemorrhage because they were well, very nice premature babies were not without suffering such so uh, deeply like a premature baby of 24, 25 or 26 weeks uh, uh, during the first three, four days of life. And not rarely uh, this kind of appearance are not so quick. What's about post-hemorrhagic ventricular dilatation? Can we try to think about a sort of link with the gestational age that was the aim of my talk in order to give you an idea of how the IVH perform differently during this kind uh, of uh, maturing brain? Well, um, we learned a lot uh, uh, about uh, Linda's work uh, that uh, earlier it is to face the complication, better it is for sure. We learned uh, the cutoff uh, related to the gestational age, also thanks to Malcolm Levine's original paper of 1981, in which the, the, wide, um, the, the, the level of the diameter of the ventricles was very useful to notice. And uh, there are nice uh, data as well, telling us that maybe instead of, of waiting four millimeters above the 97th centile, it may be better to intervene at the 97th centile too. Uh, there is a paper uh, also about the outcome of this baby from Utrecht group. And also we, we know when to intervene but we know that even if we use the same cutoff and babies are referred from different hospital, so it is a sort of prey I'm saying here. So please refer these babies as early as you can when you understand that the dilatation is uh, uh, going on and causing uh, the doubt at least that we need a neurosurgical uh, approach. But what's about, uh, potential difference related to the, to the um, neurosurgical approach uh, according to gestational ages. Well, we, we using a different uh, system compared to the most common one, the Omaya or other kind of catheter uh, put, and we put a, a external ventricular device. But what I'd like to to say is not uh, speaking about this kind of uh, neurosurgical approach uh, we're very fond of in our hospital, but uh, to see that uh, the main outcome is to treat hydrocephalus, of course, but the second main outcome is to treat temporarily the hydrocephalus in order to let the baby uh, living without a permanent ventricular peritoneal shunt. And as you can see, if you are of uh, lower gestational age, like in our group, uh, like uh, these babies of 27 weeks, uh, uh, they have an higher risk to have the permanent uh, VP after the external ventricular device. And this is probably due to the um, individual capacity of each uh, patient to clear up the CSF from the blood. And I, I'd like to share with you some sort of anecdotal image in order to understand that we still need to know a few things because we're speaking about, uh, we're certain that is a venous type of uh, hemorrhage, but we don't know exactly how the hemorrhage really is uh, going on. And if you see that uh, video, you can see uh, on the red arrows, the sludging in these tiny vessels, in these tiny ventricles, not enlarged. This is a 27-weeker baby that uh, 
developed uh, that kind of image on real time, as you can see. Uh, and, uh, but it didn't have a clot later on. It was the first hour of life. So we said, well, it's not clear what the baby has. But when we scanned the baby with the uh, susceptibility weighted imaging uh, at term corrected age, there was still some hemosiderin saying, well, for sure that baby had uh, interventricular hemorrhage, probably due uh, to uh, the germinal matrix hemorrhage. And uh, sometimes it's uh, easier to see this sludging because you have also, you can see here, uh, the movement uh, of the blood inside uh, the CSF, you see the color is gray, is not black. But uh, what is uh, really strange, because we, we were thinking to a sort of, uh, you know, uh, drop by drop kind of system. But if we observe that this baby is very, have a, have a look here <laughs> around the arrows, you can see a different kind of blood seems to be coming uh, like a volcano, no, on waves. Uh, and so we, we do not know uh, how this uh, hemorrhage does appear uh, and if it's continuously on a sort of wave kind of in this baby. What I'd like to discuss with you is uh, of course, we have very premature babies at higher risk, uh, uh, a very high risk of developing uh, interventricular hemorrhage, but they do have as well other kind of hemorrhage, like for instance, uh, the uh, cerebellar hemorrhage that probably is inversely related to gestational age. And we probably, we do see less uh, or reduce his incidence of these babies compared to 10, 15 years ago. But what's about uh, the gestational age and this association with the cerebellar hemorrhage or the atrophy? Uh, because it's not always so clear. So we, there are a number of papers uh, uh, that boomed during the last decade uh, about the association between IVH and cerebellar hemorrhage. And uh, what is in our minds is that uh, sometimes if smaller babies have a higher risk of having uh, IVH plus, uh, especially for the most severe, fortunately, pretty, pretty rare uh, cases. And this is again our uh, data that we are and showing from our data set on MRI, and you see around 200 babies with IVH, those having cerebellar hemorrhage on MRI, including also minor forms of cerebral hemorrhage, uh, well, uh, it's not such a, a small part of them, they still have uh, a cerebellar hemorrhage, and they tend to be younger. It's, it's of course, it's just uh, uh, not so, uh, is not a published uh, um, uh, data, uh, but I'd like to share with you as well. But there is an, an adding problem too, that we know that when babies develop hydrocephalus, they do have sometimes problems in the cerebellar volume and cerebellar atrophy as well. And we're still debating how important is the cerebellum for uh, even the cognition development of babies. And the first group to, uh, from, from Dr. Pryor uh, from Austria, putting a lot of emphasis about this combination of uh, this baby with cerebellar atrophy. And they still uh, of the cerebellum do, uh, together with the post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus, so you can see the data of this paper showing that kind of combination. And it's really fascinating nowadays to think about the combination of problems. You have blood in the ventricles, the blood is inside the two lateral ventricles, is going to the third ventricles, is going to the fourth ventricle, is going to the Cicerna mania. This is a baby who came from a different hospital uh, and from the referring hospital, you do see 
the blood around uh, the blood around uh, the cerebellum easily observed, and you can easily see the atrophy later on uh, in this baby. And it's fascinating to think, like David Lay has shown, that uh, uh, these these problems uh, may be due to a direct uh, insult to the external glandular layer of the cerebellum from the blood uh, coming from uh, other parts of the brain. And so uh, we're very happy if a baby has a grade two IVH, but we may need to think about how uh, that blood may affect also the cerebellum uh, in uh, different kind uh, of levels. And we have occasional um, post-mortem appearance or in which you do see the external granular layer floating into the blood, not caused by the cerebellar hemorrhage, but, but coming from the intraventricular hemorrhage, you see the external granular layer. Of course, these are artifacts, not sure about that, uh, but uh, pretty intrigued by that kind of external granular layer. So we still do not know uh, how many potential hazards to the brain are there. What I'd like to speculate with you, uh, I think the right verb is speculate in order to understand better the entire uh, problem of intraventricular hemorrhage, not only the dilatation of the venous infarct, but also how the white matter can be affected. I'd like to thank a, a good friend of ours, uh, uh, that is uh, David Lay from Lund, uh, that he firstly discovered uh, and thought on his experimental animals that uh, the blood can pass the ependema and may be affecting the, 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 the brain tissue. So we we wish to understand and to study if babies uh, of different kind of gestational age may have a different kind of uh, uh, problem in the white matter. Uh, and we, of course, arbitrarily put a cutoff uh, in terms of gestational age between uh, 28 and 29, because we know that uh, up to 28 weeks, it's very difficult to speak um, of white matter because there is no myelination in the white matter. And therefore, as you can see from these very nice uh, papers from Bach, we, Linda, we should uh, may have him speaking about white matter in the following uh, um, appointments uh, and of webinars. And we observe in these babies, thanks to sophisticated MRI techniques, uh, I'd like to share with you uh, that the white matter may be differently affected in different uh, gestational ages of the babies. So below 29 weeks, we have radial diffusivity increase. We have HAD axial diffusivity increased. We have media diffusivity increased. While above 29 weeks, we do have uh, the fractional isotropy that is uh, an indirect way of the complexity of the white matter to understand how connected the connectivity of the white matter. We used a lot in the past. But so why above 29 weeks we have fractional isotropy affected? Well, again, uh, speaking speaking there about hypotheses, but in my opinion are pretty fascinating because at that time, the white matter is mature enough to be inflamed and therefore the white matter can be reduced in the fractional anisotropy as nicely shown by the London group in which uh, it was shown that the hemosiderine uh, passing the ependema and causing inflammation and activation of astrocytes. While below 29 weeks, if we, see, uh, if we see the MRI, we do see that uh, the white matters may be directly destroyed. And uh, on this extremely nice paper from David Lay, 
we, we could see how even intact uh, red blood cells can be seen very close to the ependyma and uh, while further down the destroyed kind of red blood cells may impair the white matter that is not inflamed but directly destroyed potentially. So this is uh, starting with the second part. So we've been speaking about IVH and very premature babies and IVH uh, maybe later on. So they are typical intraventricular hemorrhage. I really did fall in love with the disease, uh, seeing that case when I was in Leeds in which uh, by mistake we performed the MRI, uh, ultrasound and we discovered an, an, an intraventricular hemorrhage uh, at day 16, so very extremely late. And why this baby had that kind of appearance? The MRI disclosed very nicely. Uh, the baby was uh, thrombophilic uh, and the, that there was uh, a proper, a proper uh, synovenous thrombosis. And this synovenous thrombosis uh, is uh, more, it's a rare disease, misdiagnosed for sure, much more important in term babies than in premature, but possible, especially on late premature babies. And the way the white matter is affected by venous thrombosis is thanks to uh, venous hypertension that is causing uh, focal edema, increased venous pressure and uh, automatically also the lack of uh, uh, arterial uh, feeding and therefore the white matter is very slowly uh, about to die. And we collected a number of patients uh, in between Leeds and soon after I arrived in Milan in which it was clear that uh, the echogenesis uh, that usually we do see higher in the first few days of life uh, was vice versa in these babies, was lower uh, around the ventricles at that age, but day by day it was increased, showing that uh, the sign of uh, um, synovenous thrombosis that was causing that. So in other words, uh, uh, this, this idea is now well uh, in our minds, again, thanks also to uh, Linda and Utrecht group, in which uh, we have to pay attention to those babies uh, uh, at low gestational, at higher gestational age with the strange uh, IVH. And I'd like to share with you a very strange case because it's, we are sort of, and my group too, uh, very, very unhappy when we do see an hemorrhage and we shouldn't see it. This is a 34 weeker in which there is a tiny hemorrhage, we, of course, we may say, well, what's the point to scan an MRI with MRI? The point is we, are, we want to understand. And we do see here this uh, appearance that at that time we really did understand. And again, uh, by maybe too much uh, uh, prudent approach, wise approach, we repeated the ultrasound scan and we discovered an alteration later on. What's, what's why the baby should have that that was not that before, a few months later. And the baby developed a cavernoma. We couldn't understand a cavernoma at that time, but this is not because I'm very fond of cavernoma that is so rare, or should I speak about papilloma causing a, a ventricular dilatation, but just to tell you that uh, strange, the IVH is better is to uh, deeply investigate the causes. This, the baby underwent after long discussion with the neurosurgeons, uh, um, the mm, uh, surgical treatment. So we already face, I'm about to close and entering a day in the problem of uh, intraventricular hemorrhage uh, and these babies and uh, starting with the term babies. And we should speak about uh, here something else. When we move to term babies, we have symptomatic babies. When we are still in the area 
uh, of late preterm, when we speak about encephalopathic baby, it's sometimes vague. Sometimes it's only maybe a bit floppy. Maybe they don't even have a very nice feeding attitude, energy. Uh, and so it's not so easy to understand when a baby is symptomatic. Sometimes it's very symptomatic. This, was, this baby was fitting. And uh, when you do see an uh, uh, appearance on ultrasound like that one, that we name thalamic hemorrhage, you have to run in the MRI unit in order to diagnose something else. And it, this uh, very old but useful uh, retrospective uh, paper from the San Francisco group, uh, we, we, it was clear that when you had an IVH, you had to exclude the sinovenous thrombosis because we, with MRI, we have a very nice confirmation of that. We discussed again that kind of potential problems. And uh, what I'd like just to highlight here is that uh, I love ven sinovenous thrombosis because you can do things. Uh, sometimes neuroimaging, uh, or often I would say, is telling you uh, the, I don't know, the, a brilliant diagnosis or maybe a prognosis kind of thought, but uh, in this disease, you can interfere. Uh, with Linda, we joined uh, ages ago, uh, um, a, an important uh, uh, randomized, potential randomized trial, but uh, we discuss also together and we, we feel now that when we do see something like that, that is extremely worrying in terms of blood, because you see the IVH, you see the thalamic hemorrhage, you see the white matter injuries, what we call propagation of the venous thrombosis in the medullary vein, in the premature, much easier in the frontal part of the brain that is less developed compared to the posterior part of the brain. This is a term, baby. And we do offer uh, anticoagulation therapy despite the baby as IVH. Of course, there is no such strong evidence, uh, uh, but it's getting uh, stronger that kind of evidence that uh, ethically speaking is uh, probably, and this is my opinion, uh, ethical to offer treatment, uh, although it may uh, be a risk for the baby, but I think it's worth to try. Uh, and you can observe the outcome on this baby that I'm not saying the baby is totally um, um, treated uh, thanks to that, but for sure dramatically uh, in the British sense of, uh, sense of the word improved. So, for the next part, I would uh, stop now here because I wasn't prepared to talk to you about this part yet, because I was supposed to speak to you tomorrow. And I'm still sorry for that, that we couldn't hear uh, Praven Balab speaking about uh, uh, germinal matrix interventricular hemorrhage and why the babies do develop a hemorrhage. So I tried to, uh, to fill the job uh, 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 at the best way. And uh, mm, I'm happy, of course, to discuss with uh, uh, many of you uh, if something was not clear or you have different opinions. And we'd like to see uh, your expertise and your ideas uh, on this subject. So I thank you so much for your attention. Uh, before to enter the interventricular problems uh, of term babies, that is very different from the uh, very premature babies. Well, thank you so much, uh, Luca, and especially kind of stepping in at such a short notice. Um, before we go to your questions, we already see here that there's an exciting meeting coming up in early September about everyday practical challenges in neonatology. So please have a look, and um, I'm sure you will find it very interesting as well. 
So Luca, if we, there are actually almost 800 people who listen to you. Right. And, uh, so that's a large group. And we all thought it was a very interesting and uh, presentation. So thank you so much for doing this. Um, there are a few questions that I think are interesting to discuss. Um, the first one is, if you do not see any signs of an IVH, do you do MRI? And if so, when would you do it? So I think there is a, a, a potential, how to say, adding part to the question. So if we're speaking of a very premature baby, uh, I'd like to have your idea too. Uh, I think uh, it is still, uh, uh, I think I've, I was reading as well, the American Academy of Pediatrics that was uh, suggesting to discuss the need for an MRI on premature babies with parents and colleagues. For sure on a research babies uh, can be justified. Uh, on a routine baby, on a routine uh, basis, uh, you probably know we are performing MRI on premature babies, very low birth weight babies, uh, but not for sure. Uh, we can say that is so recommended to improve the outcome prediction of these babies uh, in, in the honest approach. But if we move to a sort of uh, vague kind of prematurity, like a preterm babies with an IVH, we don't understand why the baby, because it was well um, and not uh, suffering for a very difficult time, I'm definitely much more open. I would suggest to perform MRI in order to exclude uh, something uh, unusual, as I shown. And if we move to term babies, and if we simplify saying that a term baby is symptomatic uh, with, uh, and we discover an IVH, I think it's totally justified uh, to do an MRI. And I think it's uh, really important to perform an MRI as quick as possible. Uh, like for babies having seizures, to understand the nature of a seizure or the nature of IVH. And I definitely, I would love to have your, I would call support, but at least idea on this subject, because I think it's important uh, for developing the neuro skills in each, uh, in each hospital, because uh, I hope not too many uh, neuroradiologists are listening, but I think thanks to us, they are more deeply into the um, brain culture of uh, neonatal or perinatal medicine. So we have to feed them with our questions and our doubts and trying to explain and speak a lot and spend a lot of time MRIing babies without sedating them, because it is possible. Yes, and I think it also very much depends where you work. In, in Europe, we are kind of um, known to be doing the ultrasound ourselves, and we can do it quite often. But of course, the more recent recommendations from the US and also from Canada, they kind of suggest that you only do a couple of ultrasound, kind of like three during the entire perinatal period. And then, of course, you're going to miss lesions, uh, cystic lesions that are going to evolve with time. Um, and therefore, I think they may also rely more on the term equivalent HMRI. But I, I agree if that you do a lot of good ultrasound, then you're probably going to see the lesions. Uh, mostly just as well with ultrasound, except for the subtle white matter lesions and the small mm. cerebellar lesions. Um, but uh, for research purposes, MRI is a very, very important tool. And we've learned so much from doing MRI in large cohorts of preterm babies now. But there are lots of questions, uh, Luca. So well, we try. Sorry, I was too long <laughs> in replying. Sorry. Well, it was good, but I think we will try and go through some of these questions at least. They're coming in all the time. Um, the next question is about the use of your external drainage system. Um, and I also have a question about that myself. So how, lang how long can you keep the external drainage in is the question. Uh, uh, I, I may need to go back to the image because it's well explained that uh, 
we do understand when we, it is the time to take it off. And so you can do very early because you do see the dilatation is going down and the level where you put the threshold uh, is uh, going higher and higher and up. And also the quality of the liquor you see, uh, apart from, uh, um, apart from uh, um, studying the proteins there, you definitely see that. And sometimes we hope and we force uh, and we can keep even for three, four weeks uh, that kind of external drainage because it's a very, uh, I think, clever idea uh, in which is not touching, uh, not from myself, from the neurosurgeons ages ago, because the external drainage is not coming, touching directly the skin, but is coming uh, inside a cylinder. Uh, and so the level of infection is reduced. So on average, I may need to go back because no, just no, to no. give, it's I, all right. Okay, so uh, you can go for four weeks when we have been a longer time, of course, we had free infection, these babies and the higher failure of, uh, um, of uh, um, external ventricular device and to go through the ventricular peritoneal ascent. On <laughs> average, I think it's uh, between two and three weeks. And do you give antibiotics prior to the insertion or during? We do the, give antibiotics as a sort of surgical protection over the last two, three days uh, after the surgery. That's it. And, and is there a lower limit of the weight that the uh, external drainage can be used? Uh, up to now, uh, no, uh, because uh, they are very, it's very invasive. You see the pictures of the, of the paper as well. Uh, it, it sounds very invasive, but when you do see uh, performing it by the neurosurgeons, it is not. Uh, and uh, and uh, honestly, um, we didn't have so many infection because we had free infection in those that we probably asked them a lot, uh, maintaining the external ventricular device mm -hmm. for longer time. Thank you. Um... There is a question here, which I think is very interesting, asking whether the uh, PVH, IVH in the preterm neonate and the one in the late preterm neonate are both venous in nature. Uh, but the first one is related to prematurity and immaturity of the germinal matrix. And is the second one more a consequence of venous thrombosis? <laughs> That's very interesting <laughs> because uh, uh, it's a matter, I think, also of uh, being honest and investigative in your mind, you know? So uh, if we do read the papers from Wigglesworth that uh, probably you met a few times when you were in London, yes. uh, it, it was mentioning that uh, uh, the hemorrhage was coming from uh, the arterial side. Uh, La Roche and many other people uh, suggested it was coming from the venous type. And when you read all these pathology papers, uh, I don't think it's e so easy to understand. Uh, it's more convincing at the place uh, where the hemorrhage starts uh, to understand that that is the place of increased venous pressure and maybe a subependymal, speaking about uh, the caudothalamic notch. Uh, less on the posterior part of the germinal matrix because there isn't any sort of convincing uh, anatomical uh, signature to justify that. But uh, I'm still, if I have to vote, thinking that very premature babies have uh, the Venus kind of origin. And later on, and in those ones, there are still people, uh, I was mentioning the baby from Gazibiri, uh, and there were other papers as well, um, coming from the even the before, one before the Second World War, in which they saw tiny thrombosis inside these vessels. Uh, an extremely nice uh, book is from, uh, uh, you know, uh, they mentioned that, that one from, uh, US 1994, in which a lot of papers from Leach and Alvord were explaining uh, 
that it was Venus and was pretty convincing. Going on uh, in terms of term baby with uh, thalamic hemorrhage, that is one way of having CVST when it is on the inner part of the veins, but not the only way to have uh, CVST, the sign of venous thrombosis. So I would think that uh, we have to exclude uh, on those babies that there is a potential trigger of a more convincing that for premature babies, very premature babies, like a sort of venous thrombosis. And if we think about how we improved uh, being neonatologists to reduce the load of uh, intraventricular hemorrhage, I think the way of ventilating them has really did change the incidence compared to what we were doing 30 years ago or 20 years ago. Uh, and I can't say anything else, otherwise I'm going too much in that direction because I think having a baby struggling too much on nasal CPAP, I'm not sure <laughs> it was, it's so helping the first 24, 48 hours of life. I, I agree. And there actually are a few questions related to, to this uh, topic when they ask that, both- That I really did hope was Parvan <laughs> facing it because it's the most difficult one. <laughs> No, it's about whether you should do kind of thrombophilia in investigations or even whole exome sequencing if the lesion is atypical. And that's the question from uh, Silke. All uh, right, so, uh, so we, we, uh, I, I think the next step is uh, to go for a wider approach of genetics in understanding why things are going to happen. So we had in our hospital a panel uh, of um, mono uh, kind of genes uh, for uh, assessing a potential venous thrombophilic uh, attitude. And we're discussing nowadays because we think uh, maybe it's not anymore the case uh, in terms of research and going directly to a Zoma uh, because uh, maybe we have to wider uh, how our attitude to think about the pathogenesis of, of this disease. So, uh, you know, there are waves uh, in terms of uh, medicine ideas and hypotheses. For sure, thrombophilia is not anymore so uh, attracting such as it was uh, 15 or 20 years ago. Uh, there is still something but I think we have to widen our, our brain in approaching and in understanding that. Okay, um, I think a lot- you, you look satisfied by the smile by my answer, I don't know. <laughs> I'm interpreting, uh, Linda, you. Okay, well then the time is actually almost Going. up. There's right. probably a last question that we should take. Um, in case of an IVH, um, PHVD in grade three plus IVH, <laughs> secondary to sinovenous thrombosis, would you also treat in a preterm baby, for instance, 33 weeks? And if so, when would you start treating that preterm baby considering severe IVH and preterm age? Well, so they, they, they're really tempting us on this subject, uh, but they, they are pretty courageous uh, doctors and colleagues. So in preterm babies, I think the IVH is really uh, a small epiphenomenon uh, disclosing the white matter involvement. Uh, and the nice thing is that you, if you MRI the baby, you better observe what we have named propagation. Now, if it is the case of not to prolong uh, uh, low molecular weight heparin in babies having uh, this propagation for months to help the white matter to restore better uh, than without uh, um, anticoagulation. I don't know. I am tempted to perform on term babies because I think it may reduce inflammation of the white matter during hemosiderin. It is an idea, potential idea. 
The problem of uh, putting babies on anticoagulants, uh, I think for premature babies, it is extremely dangerous in the first three, four, five days of life, uh, because the, the, how to say, the game is not over in terms of IVH, but later on, much less. Uh, so this is again, uh, on a theoretical basis, we're not speaking about evidence-based medicine, we're speaking about uh, uh, ideas, uh, how to reduce uh, the, I think still the beauty of this uh, thrombosis that we can do something or we can uh, try to do something. And to be honest, up to now, I don't know if we've been lucky or not, when we put on uh, heparin these babies, we didn't see, observed uh, any uh, significant deterioration of the IVH. Yes, I, I think you are saying a few really important things, uh, Luca, and I would like to underline these. Uh, I think if you just have an ordinary large periventricular hemorrhagic infarction, I would not use anticoagulation. Um, because it's really impaired venous drainage. And I don't think that giving anticoagulation is going to solve that problem. But I think if you have a, a baby who after a couple of weeks, which is kind of typical in a preterm baby, all of a sudden has symptoms and you see on Doppler ultrasound and confirm with MRI that you do have a sign of venous thrombosis, then the risk of re-bleeding is probably pretty small. And then I also would like, and we have done a few times over the last year in Leiden with Silke Stegra, treat these preterm infants. And they quite often presented like irritability all of a sudden, mm. and people did a careful ultrasound and found that there was a sign of venous thrombosis. So there, I think it's really important to make the diagnosis and help and preserve the white matter. So again, thank you very much for stepping in today. That was really very helpful. And I'm looking forward to continuing this discussion tomorrow. And um, we will see how. <laughs> We'll see how and, we, and with just, whom. <laughs> yes, well, there was just an email coming in from Praveen, so we can maybe discuss it together after All this. Right. Okay, well, thank okay. you very much, and we will continue tomorrow. Thank you all for participating. Thank you to all of you, to Joseph and Corrado as well, please. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you to you. Very, very, very wonderful lesson. Very wonderful. Uh, thank, yeah, thanks to both of you uh, and Luca. Uh, Amazing lecture for uh, for stepping in last minute. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you so much. Have... We rescue Italian kind of. <laughs> well, <laughs> adaptability is very important. Most really a stress test this one. Thank you so much. We and, got uh, all as well. Okay, bye bye. Yes. Professor bye. Malab is bye. going to be. We, uh, we thank lecturing. all the participants and every very numerous attendees. For, I guess uh, we'd like to know from which part of the planet as well. All the Hello, best. Linda. See you tomorrow. Thanks. See you tomorrow. Bye. Recording.